Last year when my uh, now 12-year-old son, then 11-year-old son, Christopher was a, a fifth grader at Sunrise Point Elementary here in the Blue Valley School District, he, uh, he had a classmate who, um, you know, she was going through some struggles. Her mother had been dying, and then all of a sudden she was gone from the school for quite a while. And uh, the fifth graders there had to learn quite a lesson that when her mom died, what are they going to do? What can a fifth grader do? How can a fifth grader be a part of that? I, I mean, that's a time when a family is crying out for God and knowing that Christ came down here and knowing that God could do anything. They needed a rescuer. They needed a healer. But instead, this young fifth grade girl had to witness the death of her mom. And where would she go from there? Today, as we continue in our Advent series on the prophecies of the Old Testament that spoke of how amazing the coming Messiah would be, today we are looking at a book that you probably read almost every night before you go to bed, Zephaniah, who has that good bedtime reading in Zephaniah. Zephaniah is one of those prophets that all the way through, he is talking about everybody needing to repent, needing to turn, and destruction that was coming. In chapter 2, it says these words, Gather together, gather yourselves together, you shameful nation, before the decrees take effect, and that day passes like windblown chaff. Before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Here we find that they are talking about God's judgment coming, and when God came, it would be horrific for so many. But at the end of Zephaniah, we get a different picture. The, the judgment was talked about, but here at the end of Zephaniah, it's another picture that a prophet gives us of who the Messiah would be that has been promised from early on, even from back to Moses when they started prophesying about the Messiah coming. And here we find in Zephaniah 3, verses 14 through 20, a Messiah who is a rescuer. Will you stand as you are able Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment, and he has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but you will rejoice over with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all the oppressed, all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before their eyes, says the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Oh, Amen. You may be seated. John Ortberg, who is a pastor and Bible teacher, recalls the story of A Deep Down Dark by Hector Tobar. And he tells the story of 33 Chilean miners who were trapped 2,000 feet below the surface for 69 days. They had to live in the dark 
with almost no food, cut off from the rest of the world. They didn't know if they would ever see daylight again. Many of the miners, face to face with imminent death, took stock of their lives and realized they had a lot of regrets. Somebody asked Jose Henriquez, a Christian, if he would pray for everyone. As he got down on his knees, some of the other men joined him and he began to talk to God. We aren't the best men, Lord. Have, but have pity on us. He actually got more specific. Victor Segovia knows he drinks too much. Victor Zamora is too quick to anger. Pedro Cortez thinks he about the poor father he's been to his young daughter. Nobody objected. It was the beginning of something special in the deep down dark, buried under the earth, with death staring them in the face. The men got real before God and real before each other. They met every day to eat a meager meal, hear a short sermon, and then get on their knees and pray. God, forgive me for the violence of my voice before my wife and son. Or God, forgive me for abusing the temple of my body with drugs. They confess to each other too. I'm sorry I raised my voice, or I'm sorry I didn't help get the water. Meanwhile, above the surface, a rescue effort had begun. People from all over the world began trying to help, or give, or pray for the men to be saved. Unfortunately for them, the happiest part of the story is also the saddest. The drill cut a narrow hole through the rock, and the miners got food and supplies and iPads, and they started figuring out that eventually they'd be rescued and find out they're becoming famous and they might get rich. And then the confessing stops. The praying stops. The lure of money and fame undoes the transformative community that had developed in their shared suffering. They were at the best, they were at their best, when their situation seemed to be the worst. The deep down dark is the place where you know you can't make it on your own. The deep down dark is the place where you realize that you need God. In Luke 1, when Gabriel comes to Mary and says, you will have a child and he will be called the Son of the Most High and you will name him Oh, everybody can answer this question. What is the child to be named? See, that was full participation sermon right there. Jesus was the name of the child, and if you don't know, Jesus means Jehovah saves, or the Lord saves. That Jesus would come and he would rescue us from our sins, from our hurt, from our pain, from our suffering, just as Zephaniah did. But the interesting thing is, Jesus is a rescuer, manger style. When Jesus came in the manger, he didn't just, God didn't just say, hey, I'll send someone to take care of that. God said, it's my only son who will come and who will save you and who will lift you. Now Jesus said, in, if you move on to Luke 4, when Jesus gives his first sermon, Luke quotes from Isaiah 58 and Isaiah 61, and Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, the difficulty for us sometimes is we don't see ourselves as the poor or the prisoners or the oppressed or the blind. We see ourselves as only needing enough Jesus that he doesn't interfere with everything else in our lives. And just like Jesus said, that's who he came for. Zephaniah said he will rescue the lame. A rescuer comes for the lame. He comes for the exiles. He comes for those who have suffered shame and anguish in their life. 
The trouble is we don't see often that we need a rescuer, so we don't cry out to Jesus. We don't see that we need Jesus in every area of our life, and we miss so much of what we could have knowing and loving and leaning upon the Messiah. In the midst of our challenges, difficulties, pain, and bondage, when are we called to rejoice and to sing? When are we called to? In Zephaniah, he says, in the midst of talking about the judgment and everything that was coming and how there would be, they would be driven out of Judah by the Babylonians and exiled to Babylon. He starts this prophecy by saying, Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with your heart, daughter Jerusalem. So when Jesus says that, when the prophet Zephaniah says that, when is it we should be singing God's praises? When should we be singing Christmas songs that lift us up and show us how amazing our Savior is and how amazing Jesus is? After things turn around, after we're not so busy, after we realize everything's going to be okay, after we're retired and we have more time in life, when should we sing God's praises? In the midst of our pain and our suffering and our hurt and our doubt and our guilt and our shame, we are called by Zephaniah to sing to the one who will rescue us from our oppression, from our straying from God, from our hurts and pains that others may put upon us of no fault of our own. In the midst of that, we are called to sing out loud, just like when Paul and Silas were arrested in Acts 16. They were in prison, they were chained up, and at midnight they started singing hymns and praises to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them in the midst of of their suffering. Morgan Snyder tells the story of the SEAL Team 6. Does anybody remember what they're famous for? SEAL Team 6? Going in and taking out the world's most notorious fugitive, Osama bin Laden. SEAL Team 6 went and did that. Just nine months later, they took Just nine months later, after they took out Osama bin Laden, they completed another dramatic secret mission rescuing Jessica Buchanan, an American aid worker from the hands of Somali pirates. In response to her plight, two dozen SEALs parachuted into southern Somalia, killed all nine heavily armed kidnappers, and liberated Buchanan, as well as a second aid worker and without any American casualties. The heroic acts in the final moments of this remarkable rescue reveals something of the culture and character of those Navy SEALs. Here are Jessica's own words. She says, at one point, this group of men who risked their lives for me already asked me to lie down on the ground because they're concerned there might be more armored, armed terrors out there. They make a circle around me and they lie down on top of me to protect me and we lie like that until the helicopters come. To the world, this is extraordinary. But to the Navy SEALs, it was just another day's work. It's what they do because it's who they have become in Christ. Coming as a baby in a manger, one who gave everything for us. One who didn't think that we were too messed up, that the world was too dirty and messy and a horrible place, but one who stepped in the world to be with us in every hour of crisis we have. 
so that we could become more like Jesus, so that we could be ones who become like him, who rescues us from everything. We have a short video to talk about how amazing it is suffering, whatever you're going through, whatever you come to a point where you need me, if you're stressed about a test coming up as we are entering the end of the semester, if you are stressed about something going on at work or, or a difficulty or a challenge in your family, whether it's health or it's a relational issue, whatever it is, the rescuer comes down from heaven and walks with us and gives us his hand and says, let me walk through this with all of you. We have a rescuer manger style in Jesus Christ. But what about my son's friend whose mother died? They were struggling. She was suffering. She was extendedly gone from school dealing with this and the funeral and everything. And somehow in the midst of this, we say, well, I can't do anything. I'm not a first responder. I don't know how to heal her. I don't know how to fix the mother. But I, I was just amazed my, my son, who kind of likes tech, had all the classmates say something. And he, he videoed them and put together a recording and told her how much they missed her and they were excited to have her back and how important she was to them. And then when she finally got to come back, she saw that video. And it was a welcome home experience for her in the midst of when her home was shattered. Okay, that was a proud dad moment for me. It was a moment where I saw his true heart. Opportunities for us come up every day where we can be heroic, where we can be rescuers, where we can make a difference in someone's life, and that may only be a smile. It may only be a recognition that we see them. It may only be a recognition that they are important to us. But it may be taking something you're good at and helping them out. Jesus was good at saving. Jesus was good at freeing the captives. Jesus is good at setting us free when we just reach out to him and say, we need to be rescued. And he'll walk with us. He'll be with us in everything. He'll come in the deepest, darkest places in our lives. And he'll transform us so we can be more like him. Don't leave this place today without calling out to Jesus. 
and letting him rescue you. That's what Christmas is all about. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you. Thank you for giving us a rescuer. That that rescuer is not just anyone in the world, but that rescue is God himself. That rescuer is God in the flesh. And as we prepare our hearts and our minds for the coming of Jesus, help us to remember that you came to us in the worst times in our lives. That you love us, that you seek us, and that you will do anything when we reach out to you with our darkness, with our pain, which are, with our failing hope to strengthen us and give us the peace that passes all understanding. Thank you, God, for the love that we can experience in Advent, at Christmas, in any time of year. Because you are our rescuer. We know that you are our savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.